Welcome to our audience at home and to our studio audience. This is the Evidence Series and in this programme we're looking at that four-letter word, love. What does it mean? Do we need it? Where do we go from here? I'm one of your hosts tonight, Gillian Joseph, and you'll hear from me a little later on. You'll also hear from Ken Burton and his fantastic orchestra. Ken. Thank you, Ken. And Dwight Nelson is here. He'll be leading us through our program. We're talking love tonight, Jillian, because the fact is, if you get everything else about life right, but you're wrong about love, it's You've over. Blown it. Yeah. <laughs> so I get here to England, and I find this delightful magazine. Have you heard of it? Life.info. And a couple nights ago, I'm, I'm thumbing through this, and I come across a listing of signs that have apparently appeared uh, around England. For example, on a, this is on a repair shop door. We, the, the sign reads, we can repair anything. Please knock hard on the door. The bell doesn't work. <laughs> what is up for that? Can't believe it. They should have fixed the bell. <laughs> but this is, speaking of love, it's this sign that I want to focus in on. This is outside a second-hand shop. Okay? You stuff. Here's the sign. We exchange anything, bicycles, washing machines, etc., why not bring your wife along and get a wonderful bargain? <laughs> that's not, not the kind sure of. We should laugh no, at that. Should, we, we really should. Because that's not the bargain we're talking about tonight. We want to focus on genuine love. Love between a parent and a child, between siblings, between a friend. And as we're going to note in just a moment, love between total strangers. It's this question of uh, where is love? And yeah. we always yearn for it, don't we? We need it. We say that we have to have it in our lives. But the ultimate question has to be where is love? Mm -hmm. They say, love is everywhere you look. It is supposedly the basis of most world religions. Love's importance is widely known, but no one seems to know it. It's a highly sought after prize, but who truly values it? Without love, we'd probably be dead or maybe wish we were. We see love everywhere we look, but do we know what it really looks like? In a culture that's in love with love, where does real love exist? What do I mean when I say, I love you? Do any of us really know what love is? fact is, love is a part of all of our lives. When you have an abundance of love, there is joy. When you have the absence of love, there is pain. I just had the privilege of meeting Richard Warden a few moments ago. And Richard, you have a beautiful story, really an inspiring yeah. story about your experience with love. Share that with us. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a family story. Uh, it involves my father, who, when I was age six, contracted Parkinson's disease. So I grew up with a man who was physically very disabled and very mm. broken, mm. Uh, which of course for a family was disastrous. And he had to go from his job in sort of middle management and then he went to do all sorts of things. But his love for the family, in my experience, was such that he would do absolutely anything for us. Um, and he did, in the end, what I suppose some might call the most menial of, of jobs. Um, he went to pick up rubbish on the beach. It was a great job. And he did it. And he, he was he, doing it because he loved us so much. Because of his Parkinson's, he had to abandon his uh, former career Absolutely, work. and so for him it was, uh, it was devastating. But what we found, I've got a brother and a sister, yeah. uh, and we just found there was just an immense sort of reservoir of love in him, which he poured out into us. So despite his physical brokenness, yeah. he was this man who was alive. How, what kind of impact has that had on you, your dad's love? Obviously, it's gone yeah. into your very system. How has, it yeah. how has it changed your life? Well, I'm very lucky. I know I'm very lucky. Not everyone has it. But I, I think if, you, if you're loved unconditionally, you're loved not mm. because you're successful mm. or because of your achievement, and that was certainly my experience of it, then, well, you could accept yourself. And I think that was absolutely fundamental. If you can accept yourself then you've got more of a chance of accepting others, mm. accepting yourself with all your own problems and warts and all, mm. and then accepting others. And so mm. love really cascades down, in my experience, from, well, generation to generation and hopefully out to other people, one hopes. 
You know, you were very, very fortunate. You think uh, about you think about guys who have dads who are healthy, sure. but who uh, who have failed to love their sons, failed to love their daughters. Well, it depends what you mean by success. I mean, you can have a lot of outward success. That's a good point. I good think point. really, yeah. my father clearly didn't have that, and in many ways, he yeah. felt a failure. Yeah. But I think his legacy, certainly in my experience, was was just wonderful. And uh, you know, I'm I'm yeah. very fortunate to have had that. The amazing power. Sure. Of love. Richard, thank you very much for sharing with us. In fact, amazing power of love, Jillian, that sets us right up for this beautiful piece. Absolutely, absolutely. The power of love is uh, evident in this uh, next song, Caravan of Love, which is going to be performed by Victor Qua. Now, what does this song mean to you specifically? You know, you look at the world, you see so much hatred, so much division. And this song just really emphasizes the point of us just joining together. It doesn't matter about your color, you know, you might be black, white, yellow, it doesn't really matter. But we can join all together in love and be one family. Excellent. Take it away, Victor.
Caravan of Love and Victor Aqua there. Well, love is expressed in very many forms, very often through song, as we've just heard, but quite often through art, fine art. And we've got with us three young, budding, fine artists who've done some drawings depicting love. If we start with you, let us know your name. Laura. Now, what, uh, what's your drawing of? Me and my sister swing on the swings. And what does love, what would you say love means to you? Kindness, friendship, life. Do you want to read your, your poem that you've written to accompany your drawing to us? Love is long, love is short. Love is sweet, love is as big as ever. God is love, we are love. And you know it off by heart. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. That's beautiful. Rail, you've done a drawing as well. What, what's in your drawing? Well, as you can see, there's my mum, my dad, and my three sisters, and my brother, and there's me. So what does love mean to you, do you think? It means spending time with your family and those who you love and having a great time. Having a great time. OK, last but not least, you're the youngest, you're only eight. Tell us your name. Katia. Katia. Now, Katia, your picture's lovely. Four hearts. Describe that picture for us. Well, I um, drawed all the different types of love I know. Well, there's love for something special and friendship love and love between parents and God's love for us. God's love for us all, so the different types of love. You were telling me before about a, a teddy bear. What, what happens if your teddy bear loses its arm or its leg? Do you still love it in the same way? Yes. And why is that? Because God loves us no matter what. OK, God does love us no matter what. And love affects us all in different ways, in very many different ways in our lives. Love is patient. Passion, caring, when you care about people. Um, love means to me security, emotional security and uh, security with, with friends, family, just to know that there's always someone out there for you. Claire, would you like to feel this? <laughs> I knew love would be a bad question for you. I think love's really important and I think it's hard to find and I think it makes your heart feel peaceful and the rest of your life more meaningful? Um, love, I think it's about caring for people, it's about um, putting other people in front of you as opposed to for yourself I think um, and that sense of community I guess beyond romantic love I think. What about you Nick? Yeah, I think exactly that, love's caring about somebody more than you care about yourself. It's being open-minded, open to other people and I think uh, respecting other people. It's shown in different ways, I work as a psychologist so we talk about languages of love touch, talk, time, tasks and tokens. Um, and I think people have preferred options, that they preferred ways of showing love both to their significant partners and to friends and family and stuff. So for me, talking and spending time together are the two most important things. Just to show respect to other people, that's, that's the main thing. Uh, through deeds, through actions, I think. Yeah, how you treat other people around you and um, yeah, what you say, what you do. Uh, love's very important, mate. And I'd say to you, don't settle for anything but true love. I think love is everything. I think it's beautiful. It's what, uh, it's what life is about. That's what I think. Suštinu života. Znači, ljubav se prožima kroz sve u životu. Kroz posao, kroz porodicu, kroz kroz bilo šta. Znači, Jednostavno bitno je, bitno je da postoji ta neka, ta neka veza, odnosno ljubav bilo prema čemu, pa pogotovo naravno ljubav prema ne, mu, osobi muškog pola, odnosno suprotnog pola. Znači ljubav je za mene ok, ali nešto mislim yeah. posebno. Well, for me, love is about forgiveness over and over again. It's also my motivation to go to work, to a job that I enjoy, and also to go to work, to provide for people that I love. I say to my five-year-old daughter, why do you love me? And she says, because you're my mama. And I say, well, that's not good enough. Why do you really love me? And she says, well, because you look after me, you take me to school, and you feed me. And I know that without a moment's hesitation, I would lay my life down for my daughters. Now, would you lay your life down for a stranger? That's a, an entirely different question. It's one that faced Hans Huber when disaster struck at his factory in Romania. So in drei Schichten arbeiten 3000 Leute und war morgen früh so ein bisschen Viertel vor elf, wo die Produktion ganz gut in Schwung und über 1000 Leute. Es ist folgendes, es passiert was in einem großen Konzern, einer großen Fabrik. 
Dann fängt an was zu brennen, eine Produktionhalle. Jetzt muss man alles, die alle ganz alle Maschinen abschalten. Und das kannst du nicht zu einmal. Du verlierst Zeit. Und um Zeit zu verlieren, die Leute reden in Panik. Und dann haben wir gesehen, das geht nicht. Da muss man den ganzen Schalter, den Zentralschalter Schalter abschalten. Und das kann man nicht ohne Schutz, ohne Kleidung, ohne Brille, ohne Extraschutz alles machen. Geht nicht. Und zu einmal habe ich gesagt, ich mache es. Folgen kommen. Und zu einmal habe ich abgeschaltet, oben gegrannt, abgeschaltet und dann einen dicken, einen dicken Rauch, einen dicken Fall. Bumm da mal, dickes Explosion. Ich bin verwundert hier bei der linken Arm, aber ganz stark. Und die anderen haben gesagt, der ist tot, der ist weg vom Fenster. Aber ich glaube, ist jemand da oben und der guckt und hält das, hält das Arm dran. Oder ganz ein kleiner Finger dran, nicht? Wenn es diese Abschaltung vom Strom nicht gewesen wäre, wäre nichts mehr. Heutzutage habe ich geguckt, auch im Fernsehen, in Holland ist einmal Zentrum in der Stadt, einmal nichts mehr geworden, nicht? Und die Menschen im Nachher haben sich alle bedankt. Du hast uns gerettet, sonst... Aber jetzt noch einmal so was zu machen, ist ein bisschen schwer zu überlegen. Das Gefühl kannst du nicht beschreiben. Es geht um Leben und Tod. Das Gefühl kann man das nicht beschreiben. Du kriegst einmal so eine große Courage und du machst es. Und andere sagt, komm, wir hauen ab. Das, du kannst nicht jetzt alle Maschinen stopfen, das geht nicht. Nicht? Das geht nicht. Und du fühlst dich, du musst das machen. Der schaltet ab, der schaltet ab. Ein Haufen Zuschauer, als Mitarbeiter sind die Zuschauer, die denkt jeder nur an sich. Und du musst das machen. Du musst das machen. Vielleicht, wenn es nicht ich gewesen wäre, vielleicht wäre es anderes, aber zu lang zu überlegen, gibt es nicht. Du hast keine Zeit. Gibt es nicht. Die Motivation kann ich nicht sagen jetzt, welche Motivation von wo es kommt. Aber du kriegst Kraft, du steigst oben, machst den Hebel unten, knallt es und ist vorbei. Heute zurückzudenken ist ganz einfach. Aber damals war nicht einfach. Zurückzudenken mehr als gut machen. Gut machen heißt, die Leute zu lieben, nicht wegzuschoben, die auf die Seite. Ich muss nicht nur an mich denken. Wenn ich an mich damals gedacht habe und noch ein paar Leute, war ganz einfach. Du gehst weg, läufst weg, alle, dann gibt es einen riesen Knall, nicht? Und die können sich nicht mehr retten. Du musst jemand auch mit retten, warum sollst du weglaufen? willing to give his life for essentially strangers. Mm. Same factory, but strangers. Let's talk about uh, love in society, love in community. We have two experts with us today. I'm thinking of Val Bernard, chair of the Behavioral Science Department, Newbo College. Lydia Godina, who is first a social worker and now a psychologist as well. Ladies, wanna, uh, I want to pursue this community society aspect of love. What, what, what is the role of love in society today? Um, today, definitely love is to bring healing, to bring healing to communities. And it's, it's really the glue that holds society together and holds communities together. From a psychologist's point of view, Lydia, what, what's the role? What does love do for human civilization? Psychologists claim that love is really basic need that humans have. And the absence of love really makes for very uh, difficulties that people experience in their life. Mm -hmm. And there is plenty of evidence to see that. Mm -hmm. Do we malfunction without love then? Can we not actually have normal lives if love doesn't exist within our lives? We do have life. I'm quite cautious with the word normal. But we do malfunction, I, I, I would dare to say, 
every aspect, as I said before, really is affected by that. We mm. become so needy that we have difficulties giving. Mm. We're postmodern now, society is. What has happened to love in our essentially secular society, Val? I think that love has become dehumanized. It's, it's without emotion. It's just a short trip and it's superficial. Um, Postmodernism is about, you know, so many different alternatives mm. and fragmentation. And that's what we see happening in mm. our society. Mm -hmm. People not being able to be connected and to be attached. Lydia, a lot of uh, superficiality. I wrote in on the tube uh, yesterday. You have all these billboards, Hollywood's version of love. What's the price we pay for that kind of superficiality? Well, I would just like to point to the fact that we like to feel good about ourselves, don't it's true. we? true, yeah, absolutely. And we, in order to feel good about ourselves, we do things, really, that appear that are doing good. And even maybe, I would dare to say, heroic acts, as we heard about just a minute ago. Which aren't really uh, uh, selfless acts, you're saying? I, I would not uh, dare to judge, but there is this debate whether when we are doing things, are we doing them just because mm. we want to feel good, to alleviate guilt, to be heroes, or it is real, real altruism. Yeah, this altruism, I mean, how, how does it manifest itself? It manifests itself in heroic acts. It manifests itself in doing good things, in commitment, not in just being good from time to time, but really being committed to being empathetic to your fellow man. But does altruism really exist then? Or are we helping others and, and doing these kind, loving things? Because it makes us feel good. Isn't it a selfish act to love? Go on. OK, that's a very interesting question because, I mean, in, sociologically speaking, we, we make decisions about acts of love, mm. acts of giving, weighing up the costs and the benefits. And some people would argue that that's selfish, and others would argue that it's about, it's about our need to, to feel good about ourselves, our need to connect, our need to keep going will actually make us do things that are heroic. But uh, Lydia, how can I grow this love? I mean, we live with this uh, synthetic form. Is there a way I can rise above the social norm? I like a statement that suggests that self is like a muscle. And that you can that exercise. Love, love is it. like a muscle? Well, Self if, is like a muscle? Absolutely. Mm. And that you can exercise. Mm. Uh, even though that I before said if we, if we have not been loved, that we, have been, we, we are going to be impaired. But I do believe that we can exercise this muscle, really, and become more lovable society mm. and individuals. That's positive. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> Val and Lydia, thank you very much for being a part of the evidence. Okay, we all know that love is about giving and receiving. This next item is entitled Sending Out Love and is performed by Yolanda Alexander. What does this song mean to you? Send Out Love means sharing, giving. The more love you give, the more love you receive. Is that true? The more that you give, the more you receive? Most definitely. Okay, we look forward to hearing. Thank you.
Send Out Love. I love that song. Beautiful. He was 23 years old, already deep into his studies at Cambridge University when the dreaded plague struck that summer. The year was 1665. Isaac Newton, grabbing the few books he could, fled to his family farm at Woolsthorpe in Lincolnshire. Because of the plague, he would end up remaining there 18 months. But what an 18-month period that turned out to be. One historian, in fact, has called it the most fruitful 18 months in the intellectual history of the world. Take a look at the screen. During those months away from Cambridge, the young Newton, notice this, number one, calculated the law of gravity. Number two, invented the infinitesimal calculus. Number three, developed the three basic laws of thermodynamics. And number four, set down the foundation for the science of optics. And all of this while lollygagging around the family farm. But, and this was typical of Isaac Newton, he didn't tell a soul what he had done. About 20 years later, some of Britain's most illustrious Intellectual luminaries are huddled around a, a London coffee house table. Topic of discussion tonight, heated discussion. It's the law of gravity. Finally, it's decided that Edmund Halley is to go f visit Mr. Newton and inquire about uh, his understanding of the law of gravity. By this time, Isaac Newton is the greatest mathematician in England. So, Halley arrives at Newton's office, explains in great detail the problem, and then asks for Newton's advice. Without skipping a beat, Newton turns around and fires back the very answer. But how, how can you possibly know that this quickly? To which Newton replied, I've worked it out long ago. Show me, Halley retorts. Now, according to the story, Newton begins to rummage all through his office and cannot find the papers he wrote up while back on the family farm as one of his early biographers expressed it. While all of England, I like this, while all of England was looking for the law of gravity, Isaac Newton lost it. Eventually his material was published. World famous book, Principia. A book not many can understand today, but that book has revolutionized the way the world journeys now into the third millennium. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, it's hard for you and me to comprehend today the impact of Isaac Newton. His discoveries were a revolution in thought, not only intellectually, not only philosophically, but even culturally. Isaac Newton's profound impact, an Englishman, on the life of this planet in the third millennium. I think the poet Alexander Pope expressed Newton's scientific achievement best with these words. Here's Alexander Pope, put it on the screen for you. Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night 
God said, let Newton be, and all was light. Halley, commenting on Newton's work, would later write, nearer to the gods no mortal may approach. Isaac Newton, of course, was lionized in his own lifetime. In fact, he's buried in the Westminster Abbey and had the privilege of being right there last evening. Isaac Newton. Why well, bring up Isaac Newton to us third millennials? I'll tell you why. Newton's achievement itself, because of it, has brought a compelling direction for the entire human race. You see, Principia convinced people that the world was an ordered, coherent place that could be fully understood through science. I mean, you take a little bit of reason, take a little bit of logic, using mathematical calculations with observation, Newton made the most incredibly accurate predictions. For example, number one, he predicted about the motion of planets. Number two, the movement of the tides. Number three, the precision of the equinoxes. And he was even able, through his uh, mathematical formulas, to actually target the projected trajectory of a cannonball. So after Isaac Newton and the, the development of mathematical logic, this, it, it begins to dawn on the human race. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe with the same kind of precision, we can calculate life on the rest of the planet. Maybe we can know the human body, maybe the human mind. Maybe we can even predict weather using Isaac Newton's discovery. Well, that's the, that's the reasoning going on. You and I need to remember all the while, same time, simultaneously, while Newton is doing his calculations on the inverse square law, or the nature of ellipses, or explaining. You remember this? You, you learned this in school, didn't you? The formula y to the third power plus a times x times y plus x times 2y minus a to the third power minus 2 times x to the third power equals 0. You remember that one in school? I always ended up with 0 with that one, didn't you? <laughs> While Isaac Newton is calculating that incredible mathematic, mathematical precision, I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, in Europe, Thousands and thousands of women are being burned at the stake because they are accused of being witches. But now with the, with the advent of Newton's rational science, suddenly people are beginning to reason, hey, 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 wait a minute. Maybe the crops failed because we did something wrong in how we planted them. Not because some old widowed hag down in the market got herbs from Farmer Jones, ticked off of the herbs, put a hex on the farm. Maybe George lost his mind, George down the block, not because the devil possessed him, but because something traumatic happened that caused him to simply lose it. Not that people hadn't thought about these things before. They had, but now, because of the incredible success of Newton's work, a whole movement towards science, towards experiment with naturalism, took off. And with this began what has been called the birth of the modern mind. And the notion, by the way, we don't need any revealed text. Don't give me ancient documents. I can figure it all out myself through experimentation. I use my reason. Everything we need to know we can learn through study, through science, through empiricism. Thank you, Isaac Newton. Although, interestingly enough, Newton himself worked on the assumption that the laws he had discovered were God's laws. Oh God, he wrote, Oh God, I thank thy thoughts after thee. Yet it wasn't long before God was written out of the picture completely, and the momentum for that happened in France. Let me tell you this story. Frenchman Simon Pierre Laplace, who one day was showing Emperor Napoleon a copy of his book, Celestial Mechanics. Someone in advance had told Napoleon, there is no mention of the Creator in this book. And so Napoleon, who often enjoyed asking embarrassing questions, received it with the remark, uh, Monsieur Laplace, they tell me you've written this large book on the system of the universe, but you have not mentioned the Creator. To which Simon Pierre answered bluntly, I have no need of that hypothesis. What a grand leap from Newton, who at one point commented, this is the most elegant fabric of the sun, planets, and comets. It could not have arise, save by the wisdom and power of an intelligent mind. And yet we have this huge leap until finally everything can be known by humanity in our world through reason and through science. In fact, some believe, actually came to believe, that if we could perfectly calculate the position of every atom, we could perfectly predict the future because we would have it all. We would have it all down on paper. 
Isaac Newton, reason and logic and science. But today, who needs Isaac Newton's God hypothesis? No need for any transcendence today. And that, my friends, is precisely the legacy we have received. Because we've all been nurtured on it, haven't we? Come on. We have all been formed and shaped by it. Our culture saturated with it. Schools, science, our world, everything. In the thousands of years of recorded history, only in the past 100, perhaps even less, has there been a whole civilization erected on these purely naturalistic assumptions. All the great disciplines today, you think about them. You've got psychology, you've got medicine, what else do we have? Astronomy, physics, sociology, biology, all of it today based on the hardcore materialistic presupposition that if you use logic and reason, you can get to the bottom of it all. And please, please don't get me wrong. In one sense, we are indebted to all of those sciences, aren't we? Of course we are. Imagine, instead of studying gravity itself, we stuck with Aristotle and his understanding of the universe that said it takes 50 gods to hold the planets in shape. If we were still with Aristotle today, I tell you what, there wouldn't be much getting off the ground at all, let alone getting to the moon. We needed Isaac Newton. But of course, it's a, it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? Because you think about it, the same technology that sends rockets into space sends scud missiles into homes, doesn't it? Same technology, ladies and gentlemen, the same technology that uses nuclear power to create electricity goes into dirty bombs. You've heard of that before, haven't you? However great science has been, it's taken only a few hundred years for Newton's calculation about gravity to the point where our existence today is threatened by weapons of mass destruction. Under such a specter, one could argue that maybe we'd be better off stuck with Aristotle. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever loved someone? I mean, we're talking about the love of a parent, the love of a child, a sibling, oh, all of our hands. Of course, our hands go up. They asked a group of kids the other day to write down their definition of love. Okay, these are little kids, all right? Here's one uh, child. This is, a, this is a little girl. I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> That little girl has something to learn in life, doesn't she? Here's another one. Oh, this is what love is. love is. Love is if you hold hands and sit beside each other in the cafeteria. That means you're in love. Otherwise, you can sit across from each other and be okay. <laughs> one more. I love this. This is a little girl. It has to be. Love is when you tell a boy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. <laughs> Oh, my. We're all authorities on love. Come on, of course. That's true. Now, because you are an authority, perhaps you'll be able to follow this. I trust you will. Do you believe that love, which is not an emotion but is a principle, this, this self-sacrificing that we heard about from Hans just a moment ago, do you believe that love is, is, is purely natural and of physical causes? That is, it's something that can be broken down and explained the same way you can balance an equation in chemistry? Can this love be mathematized the way the motion of a projectile can be? Or is there something in love that transcends science, that tells us there's another facet of our existence that can't be explained by materialism alone? You know, I, I don't want to be dogmatic about this, about what can't be proven, but there has to be something in the experience of love that you simply can't chart on a piece of graph, graphing paper. Those of us who have been in love, I'm certain can testify to it. It's hardly rational. It's hardly reasonable. I remember the first time I saw Karen, my bride, who was here tonight. I was a 19-year-old kid in, uh, in college. I mean, the first time I saw her with my eyes wide open, you understand. I'd seen her. But I walked in that day to the, uh, into the uh, administration building of the college, and there was this very attractive 19-year-old girl sitting behind the telephone switchboard and suddenly with my eyes wide open, I see the green eyes, I see the pink lips, I can tell there's a figure behind it all and something starts to happen to me. Now, look, I was smitten and tonight we're here three decades later just because of love. 
It really, it, there really is a, it really does happen to a human being. But I want to tell you something. If you had put a, a CAT scan on me at that moment, do an MRI, what would they have found? Okay, the, the boy is experiencing love. Oh, I'm sure that there would have been a burst of synaptic activity in the cerebral cortex. There might have been some extra serotonin or dopamine in the frontal lobe. My, I'm sure my heart rate was way up and I was sweating, just like I am now. Who knows what other chemical and biological reactions were taking place. I'm sure it's all there, all a part of it. But you know what I'm talking about. There's no way you can take the experience of a young man who was smitten by love and limited only to the variation of the very, very same processes that somehow have taught our liver to excrete bile. It has to be on a different level, doesn't it? I mean, that would be like uh, crediting Lance Armstrong's Tour de France victories to his bicycle chain. Well, he had a good chain. Impossible. Of course not. We all know that we, of course, are the sum of all the physiological processes, but love has to be more. Hey, look at your own William Shakespeare, the world's William Shakespeare. Remember his sonnets for love? Where did Shakespeare get it? Extra testosterone, was that it? A little oversupply of vitamin B? Too much Guinness? Maybe they didn't even have uh, Guinness back then. What I'm inviting you to consider today is probably the most powerful force in human experience. It's the single force that drives most of humanity. It's the force of love. It's love for spouse, it's love for children, it's love for, for friends, and how are we going to explain that kind of love? Now, I've got to tell you that the prevailing scientific theories, materialistic worldview seems rather inadequate to explain the existence of love. I mean, wouldn't you agree? How are you going to put it on a chart? But you, you, you may be saying, look at Dwight, that really is not science's business. And the moment you say that, then I say, aha, there is a realm of existence that doesn't belong to science. Right? Now, what is this thing? A whole range of science and love. I think of what the German philosopher Goethe once wrote. One thing is certain. Nothing, I like this, nothing justifies a man's existence like being loved. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? Or maybe you could put it like this. Nothing justifies our existence if we, if we don't love. Either way, ladies and gentlemen, how crucial love is to us as human beings. And it's worth noting, by the way, that something as fundamental and crucial to our existence as humans is beyond, and I'm repeating myself, but it's beyond the pale of science to explain. What's up with that? As the Oxford philosopher Brian McGee once wrote, I'll put his words on the screen here, we feel that when all possible scientific questions have been answered, the problems of life remain completely untouched. Wow. But if science can't help us, then to whom, to where shall we turn? Let me humbly make a proposal. To begin with, if I look at the Darwinian model for naturalism, and by the way, you can go to the same Westminster Abbey, Charles Darwin, along with Isaac Newton, is buried in your abbey. But if we take the Darwinian model, it, 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 I think we all would agree, it simply is unable to explain the existence of, of, of something we would call love. Now, I'm not, I'm not here tonight to get into the, uh, the creation evolutionist debate. Instead, I want to put something else on the table for you to muse, namely this. When I think about love, which involves a wi willingness, as we noted, to sacrifice yourself for the good of someone else, be willing to empty yourself of all that's yours. When I think about love and the human experience of this which heretofore remains a bit inexplicable, but when I think about love, I'm wondering, do we find it in the, in the formative beginning stages of what the Darwinian model proposes. Do, you, do we have love do, for the Neanderthals? Or if natural selection operates by the survival of the fittest, it would seem to me that love would have gone off the scene with winged dinosaurs, wouldn't it? I mean, why would you have love? If natural selection says that the survivor, the survivor is the one who wins, you can't have a Hans who says, I lose so that you could win. What is this thing of love? Is the Darwinian model sufficient, 
Self-sacrificing human love. By the way, I know that some scientists say, hey, now wait a minute. There will be times when a baboon will sacrifice herself for the sake of keeping the baboon genes going on. Well, you may be able to read a baboon's mind. I don't know. But when we're dealing with altruism, as a moment ago we talked about, how do we explain it? Is the Darwinian model sufficient? How does the human experience of love fit into that model? At what point do we move to a transition, to this higher ideal? And by the way, the moment we say higher ideal, well, who determined what the higher ideal is? Something has established our pantheon of ideals. Where did that come from? It can't be science. Uh, let's look at it this way. Take a potter. The, the, the greatest potter in all of England. Give him, give her all the clay she needs. And then give her one billion years. You can take a billion years, but out of this clay, madam, please construct an internal combustion engine. And that potter works, and that potter works. But isn't it true, ladies and gentlemen, that no matter how much time you give to that potter with that clay, those potters will never turn clay into an internal combustion engine. Will they? Impossible. Why? Because clay is not inherently possessive of the fire you need to get an internal combustion engine to explode, to make it run. They have to pour something in from outside of it, something greater than the clay, something different. The clay to be turned into a working engine only will happen if qualities not inherent to it are added by somebody or something. Isn't that true? Does that make sense? Yeah. In the same way, how can you take carbon, a little bit of water and some protein and some quarks and electrons, and how can you just mix them all up together and voila, you have self-sacrificing human love? How does that work? How has love been formed within us? A moment ago I mentioned Laplace. You remember that? Laplace's quip to Napoleon? I have no need of that hypothesis. Someone later heard of Laplace's answer and responded, too bad because it's such a beautiful hypothesis, it explains so many things. Maybe the God hypothesis of Isaac Newton, maybe that God hypothesis explains love too. Maybe love isn't something that emerges within our biological system. Maybe love has to come from outside of us, stamped into us. I want to suggest uh, a perspective on this subject. And I want to read to do this. I want to read two lines from an ancient document. The name of the ancient document is the Bible. <laughs> I realize there's a lot of controversy today about the, the, the Bible. And maybe one of these uh, days you and I can get into it. But I think we're all safe in saying there has never been a book on this planet that has exerted as significant an influence. Would we buy that? Yeah. So at least you owe it to yourself to hear, to hear what the book is saying. Oh, two little lines. First text comes out of the Bible's first book, first chapter. I'll put it on the screen for you. The book is called Genesis, and here's this one line. Genesis 1, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to profess to be able to explain what that text really means. That's, that's, that's pretty heavy. But I get enough of a sense from that text to suggest that it's saying human beings, male and female, we are together made in the image of God. Which doesn't mean that God has five fingers on each hand, five toes on each foot, and has a digestive system. Not at all. But there's something about God that's been printed into our psyche. So here comes that second line. It's at the other end of the book. It's from one of the letters that John wrote. The line is a short one. It goes like this. God is love. In many ways, I have to tell you that that single line is even more difficult to explain than the line from Genesis. However, while I don't know exactly what all those three words mean either, what it does tell me is that love is the dominant feature of His being. God is love. Now, you put the two texts together. Let's do a little bit of Newtonian mathematics. Put the two texts together. One says we are created in the image of God. The other text says God is love. Wow, could it mean 
that we who are made in the image of God, by being made in that image, we are able to love as well. Maybe that's where it came from. Maybe like the clay, it had to come from outside of us because there isn't enough clay and enough billions to let it arise naturally within us. Or, I mean, where else could it come from? Is it the carbon? Is it the electron? Is it the tissue? For me, these two texts explain what is essentially inexplicable. The ability of material beings, beings made out of things that in and of, them, of themselves are incapable of love. Nevertheless, beings who are capable, who are able to love. I realize that if you don't think love is something that comes from outside of you, that it is, in fact, just a part of the biological process, a, p a purely materialistic sort of phenomenon. You're saying, man, Dwight, I'm not putting much stock in your answer at all. But what I'm proposing is this. If, on the other hand, something within your heart just isn't satisfied with a purely materialistic explanation, if your love for your parents, your love for your child, your spouse, your best friend, if, love, if that love of yours is too precious to be relegated to chemical reactions, then perhaps you're sensing a bit of the divine in you. Could it be you are touching a part of the world that science and, and logic and reason and math are simply too crude to enter? If you've known the joy, if you've known the passion, the transcendence of love, if love has taken you to realms where nothing else has or could, then you've been to a place Newton's physics cannot enter. And Isaac Newton would, I believe, be the first to agree that they were never meant to go there in the first place. Well, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any comments or questions about this program, you can contact us uh, by visiting our website, that's lifedevelopment.info, or by calling us on 01923 665544. Living as we are in the third millennium, where science has made unprecedented advancements, could it be that the existence of human love is proof that there is someone or something outside of science? that is the source. Think about it. Be sure and join us again next time for more of The Evidence.